Okay, welcome everybody to our Thursday afternoon seminar. Today it's a great pleasure to have with us Louis Parignon, who will tell us about agnostic cosmology and the growth of uh, structures. Louis, you have the floor, please. Hi, thank you very much for having me. It's a real pleasure to, um, to be here with you today. It's also the first time I do this talk in a significant way. So I hope it's going to be okay and I hope it's going to be interesting. So pretty much the second half of the talk is going to be on some concrete um, work that we've been doing with collaboration, my collaborators here, and in particular, Matteo Martinelli. Um, but um, this, this work doesn't warrant speaking for 40 minutes. And we thought, why not just take time to maybe introduce um, this talk with some background context, so some cosmology, but also probably get into this maybe new era of cosmology, which some would, would call agnostic cosmology. So I think I'll define that later. Um, the core of our work and the one core, um, let's say, statistical method of agnostic cosmology is the use of Gaussian processes. So I would want to spend time to review briefly what has been done um, in the literature and to then get to this uh, fancy title here um, of our paper, Multitasking the Growth of Structures, and then, and then I'll conclude. Okay, so let's go. Maybe just a bit of background. I'm pretty sure everybody has seen those slides uh, millions of times, but it never hurts. So I think one of the founding principles of our cosmological model is the cosmological principle, which states that at, at a given, at large enough scales, the universe is um, homogeneous and isotropic. This is quite important because it allows us to use this Robertson, met Robertson Walker metric to describe the background evolution of the universe. So what you do is that you, the, the, the way you describe the dynamics of our expanding universe is to use Friedman equation, which you obtain by combining this metric with Einstein's equation. And you get those extremely powerful equations here. What is good to see is that this scale factor, so a typical length of the universe is linked to the energy densities of the components in the universe. And these, we generally model them as a perfect fluid. So with this type of um, equation of state and depending on what type of content, radiation, matter, dark energy, whatever, has just different equation of state um, parameters. Yes. And um, so what, at the level of gravity, what um, is our standard model, which we call lambda CM, is general general relativity, where you have your cosmological constant. And in this standard model, the CM means that dark matter is cold, and the cosmological constant is responsible for cosmic acceleration. So our understanding can be kind of summarized in this picture, where we have the sorry, the largest um, component of the universe today is dark energy. So in other words, something that drives cosmic acceleration, then dark matter at for 20%. And then let's say almost 5% is what we call baryons in the cosmologist's um, um, how do you say, wording, and also neutrinos, and I guess other particles as well. Um, so this is kind of a nice picture and um, maybe one day we'll stop here, but we're not there yet. So we do have a few problems with Lambda CM, which um, makes cosmologists think of extensions and to study even harder. Um, and one of them that is very often cited is that if you want to attribute the cosmological constant to vacuum energy, well, you will see that <laughs> the predictions and, and the um, the actual density that you attribute to the cosmological constant are different by an enormous amount of orders of magnitude. Um, something that is also, also um, sometimes put forward is the coincidence problem, um, which personally I have a bit more problems with, but it's simply to say, how come dark energy kicks in around today? Uh, something that I think we've been hearing more and more about is that we start to see very large scale structures, which kind of don't go well with um, uh, cosmological principle, so this um, isotropy and homogeneity uh, assumption. And I've pro there's probably others that you can add here. 
on maybe a more observational basis, um, <laughs> there's been quite some hot discussions and very interesting developments around tensions, observable tensions. So I think the most well-known one is on H0, when basically you have observations of the um, local universe um, that you compare with extrapolations of the CMB. You see that you have I don't know which which is the the significance of the tension, the latest um, quotation, but maybe it's more than five sigma. Um, at the level of matter perturbations, you typically see that um, weak lensing rather rather lower growth of that of of structures than the CMB. So that's another um, observational tension. I'm sure there's a few more that we can could add add here. Um, so what happens then? Then, well, theoreticians go to work and go to work a lot, and um, you get to have a lot of Lagrangians, and you have a extremely rich um, um, amount of theories that could um, explain deviations. Um, but so this is is maybe um, extremely interesting for. On the theoretical point of view, but I want to say, on a from a for a phenomenologist, it's practically a nightmare, because what happens is that for each proposal, each Lagrangian that you have, you want to derive your your um, equations of motion, and um, couple that to your to Boltzmann solver, write your code, do everything, then compare to observations, etc. But that that is just absolutely crazy. Um, Although we're getting there, but there's another path, let's say, that could be taken, which is what we would say more model independent. So I've put those quotation marks because it seems as well this to be quite a, a fancy word that is used a lot. But I'm wondering here, this is an experimental slide, which is just more questions and answers. And I'm sure there's a lot of literature that I have no clue about yet, and I'm really starting to be interested in. And I find this really fascinating. Um, this what is model independence and how can you work in, in that direction. But I'm just wondering if at the moment we're not chasing um, just an illusion really. So do we really have a common definition? Um, I'm, several people have different definitions of what is model independence. Um, I think, for example, the what is not model independent is when you have a model and you constrain it like a theory, a true theory of gravity, and you constrain it with oper um, observations. And this is actually very powerful because that's the case where you can say, I will use all cosmological probes. I will do my Bayesian analysis. I will compute a Bayesian ra bias ratio between two models. And I will be able to tell you this model does a better job than this one. So, so far we can reject one and we can keep the other one. Um, so that is very powerful, but that goes back to this picture that you have to do that for every model and it's like a very complicated task. Then you have maybe more parametrized, so let's say phenomenological approaches, where you will try to par parametrize theories, um, but you still can, you still be able to, since you can compute your, ob your observables from those parametrization, you'll still be able to do some bias comparisons. Um, but given a phenom I, I will go in a bit into detail, but given a phenomenological parametrization, say of W, um, so the dark energy equation of state, you will only be able to access probes that constrain are sensitive to this. So I, it's still a relative comparison between models, but you can only use a limited amount of probes. And now I guess what is really kicking in as a, a, a common tool is data-driven reconstructions. So this is more of an absolute statement in a sense, I'm going to pick a data set, I'm going to reconstruct the trend that the data wants. And then I can say, well, anything that is not within that reconstruction should be rejected. So typically this leads to null tests and things like that. But here I said few probes, but I should say, yeah, it's very few probes because obviously here you're just concentrating on one specific data set. Or when you're lucky, with this multitask approach, it's a few extra data sets, but it's still a very limited thing. So one could could wonder how 
how actually how strong is your statistical claimant by saying I reconstructed the evolution of H, and I see that this reconstruction doesn't include lambda CDM, so lambda CDM is disfavored, is rejected. However, I'm just making a claim based on those data on H, H and you know that well, it's important to include all the, the, the pros of cosmology. So yeah, my question is how far can we go? And I think that machine learning is really what's going to take us to a next level um, in the future. So I think I'm going to try and drop the idea of the word of model independence as much as I can and go to what we would call model agnosis. I can't really pronounce that. <laughs> so a model agnostic approach, which let's say we're not going to be model independent because behind is always a, um, either statistics, something that is modeling, but we will go to reconstructions that don't assume a gravitational theory. So if you, you could call them gravitational theory independent or like agnostic of gravitation. Um, so let me, given said, having said this, maybe let me go through from the things that have been pushed forward as model independent um, since I, I started my PhD, which was, I don't, I don't remember, maybe five years ago or something like this that I've like kind of followed then try to classify them from the most model in the most dependent model dependent within the model independent um, categories. So I'm going to start by just just mention because all of this is not things that I've absolutely not worked on, but I've seen, um, which I, I just entitled parameterized modelings, because basically what you're doing is you're still kind of um, assuming a, a gravitational paradigm, but you're parameterizing it to recover different types of theories. So by doing tests on this uh, parameterized paradigm, you'll be able to exclude sub theories. So I think one of the first ones probably used in test gravity is the PPN, parameterized post-Newtonian formalism. This is just an expansion around the Minkowski metric. I think this is important to mention because this has shown how solar system tests constrain gravity to be that of GR on those scales at a like extreme um, confidence level. So basically making no doubt that any dark energy field or whatever needs to vanish from the equations in the solar system, for example. Something that I really don't know much about is the parameterized post Friedmanian formalism. I think there's two important papers, two different approaches, one from Wayne Hu and then one from um, Pedro Ferreira and collaborators. So I'm here this description uh, refers to the second one. Um, is just a framework, uh, an expansion of um, Einstein's equations, which handles any extra spin zero degrees of freedom. And something that I can relate more about because I've worked on that a lot in the before is, is the effective field theory of dark energy. So that basically is a paradigm that encapsulates all, um, all, all theories that include one extra scalar degree of freedom. So generally you could refer to them as Horninsky theories, but there's been explorations notably found by using this effective field theory rather than working on the covariant description has led to finding um, stable theories beyond the Horninsky Lagrangian, so GLPV, um, or sometimes just called beyond Horninsky, or also DO, DHOST, which did, is degenerate higher order uh, scalar tensor theories. Yeah, and I think this also has been extended to vector to include vector perturbation and tensor. Um, but yeah, I'm going to stop stop here uh, for that. N then, um, so those are still like, as you see, this encapsulates any spin zero. This is uh, encapsulates, well, practically the same thing, but in a different way, etc. So now let's maybe go back, go to cosmology rather, um, phenomenology. So I think there's, again, this is none of what I'm saying is exhaustive. I just wanted to give a little picture to, to motivate what's coming after. But I think in these model independent tests, you then decide to model um, a specific feature um, that we can see that, that we want to constrain. So for example, dark energy could lead or modified gravity could lead to have a 
um, equation of state parameter of dark energy to, to be actually a function and to vary in time. And we generally use this, we often use the CPL parameterization, which tells you that um, now you um, have a Taylor expansion around A, A0, I think, A equals zero. Um, and you just mod mod model this with two, um, two parameters. And um, this has been constrained a lot by big co collaborations, et cetera. And you can see a result here where, for instance, you will see that CMB will put this, oh, I should have said this cross some um, characterizes lambda CM. So W0 is minus one and WA is equal to zero. And you can see, for example, that it's quite interesting that like CMB by itself doesn't really want or want to um, have to include um, a lambda CM. But then when you add, for example, I think what really pulls is the supernovae. Yes, it is the supernovae. Then, then you pull back the constraints to having lambda CM really in the, in, in the center. Anyways, an analogous of this type of phenomenological parameterizations is um, in the perturbation sector. This is something I mentioned for the background evolution of the universe. You, I could have cited, for example, the uh, talks about the cosmographic expansion. But yeah, on the perturbation side, um, you might have heard of this mu eta parameterization, mu sigma, g light, g matter. Anyways, it's just to say that I'm going to parameterize with a function the any possible deviations from um, the Poisson equation. So basically trying to capture any changes of gravity between, uh, I mean, the gravitating properties of two massive bodies while eta is the gravitational slip parameter. So this will tell you how, um, when you do perturb FLRW, how the difference between the ratio between your Newtonian potential and your um, curvature potential. So phi over psi or psi over phi, depending on your convention. Um, and so a little wink to uh, Matteo, because he's the one who's implemented that in Planck. And this figure corresponds to these functions being proportional to omega dark energy. Um, so you see, same thing is quite interesting because the, the lambda CDM factor is not, um, um, no, the lambda CDM point is not necessarily recovered by all the data sets. So those tend to get closer to null tests, but they're already um, specific because when you have parameterized, so you have made a, a choice of model, but you try to make this model capture be general enough so you can make the claim of being um, model independent. Um, so let me now go to the last part where what I was saying was that this road towards model independence, or at least more uh, humbly model ag ag agnosticism, I guess, um, is is really, I mean, it's really get it's now now is getting extremely. Um, competitive and notably with the, the use of machine learning. So it's, the first item is not necessarily machine learning, is principal component analysis. But again, we are getting to things that I know less and less, but I did feel like I, I should mention them. So PCA, I think, is something that's been around for a long time and has been you know, definitely fits this um, idea of model agnostic. Um, Gaussian processes is something that is now used a lot and in cosmology, but probably in astro even before. Um, so these are still a mystery to me, but basically most of the rest of the talk are going to be dedicated to this. Um, there's another thing, which is genetic algorithm, which allows you to predict functions from data. So not parameters of functions, but directly functions. So that is um, something very intriguing so that I do. I'm going to work on very soon. And I wanted to take this occasion to congratulate um, Ruben. I hope I pronounce, I'm not sure where the, <laughs> the accent makes, where you have to insist, but anyways, Ruben and Savas for putting out their paper today. I was so deep into those slides that I haven't, I only read the abstract, but I just thought, um, and that's your second paper, I think Savas with genetic algorithms. Um, and maybe in the most general, um, way of being model agnostic is really with deep learning when you have those um, neural networks. 
that you just go from a map of the universe to inferring a value of a cosmological parameters, which to me just sounds completely crazy and extremely interesting. So I think this goes under the hat of likelihood free inference. Um, so this is something I would like to explore very soon. Okay, so I'm about halfway through and I'm getting to the Gaussian process. So me just a, a bit of basics, let's say, of Gaussian process, although there may be not basics. <laughs> um, just think of a Gaussian process as the collection of the distribution of random Gaussian variables, and each of them are defined by a mean and a covariance matrix. So basically, when you reconstruct a function, you will just say that at any redshift, b x this redshift, you will say that the Gaussian process, the reconstructed function is described by a given mean at a given point of redshift and a covariance matrix that um, gives you how those means are um, linked together across all the, the, the redshifts. So this is typically what you call the kernel. And yet, uh, sorry, I'm giving you the example of the squared exponential kernel. I think it's the one that has been the, used the more in um, in literature, so and it's very simple to talk about. So that's also why I'm showing it. But it's also the one we used in our papers. So um, it's it's described by two hyperparameters, so the signal variance here and the correlation length here. So you see that this will allow you to um, capture, let's say, modifications along the y-axis, and correlation will tell you how. Um, all your points are correlated with one another. So, for example, if this kernel will be typically zero if your two, if you the two points you're looking at are very far away, or it will be equal to sigma squared when those two points are the same. So, there's a, I mean there's a lot of statistics and computations, and I would refer you to the the Bible of Gaussian processes written down here to have the details. But basically. With a bit of compu analytical computations, you can derive a likelihood. This is called the log marginal likelihood. And typically, in a machine learning way, is that if you given if you have a data set, you will optimize the hyperparameters, which means nothing but minimizing your likelihood and finding the best fit of those parameters. And once you have the best fit, you can then predict the mean of the function that you're reconstructing, reconstructing here using this. And you can predict its errors, its covariance using this. Um, so, I mean, given a set of hyperparameters, you can compute a mean and a covariance. But the point is, when you have a data set, you want to find the, the best fit. And so you input in the kernel here the values of your best fit hyperparameters. Just want to quickly um, point towards this quantity here, which is. So I, I don't, I'm not describing all those in detail. I'm not so sure it's super important. But um, C is, is your data covariance matrix. And you have, beyond those two hyperparameters, you have an input that is um, up to you, so a prior when you reconstruct the mean. And that will impact uh, your likelihood. Those mu, the mu is the mean function. So mu will be the mean function of the data, and mu on, at the redshift of the data, and mu star is the mean function at the redshift on which you want to reconstruct the function. So all that I, I'll come, I'll use that again. It's quite an important point. But this is a prior input. So let's say the statistical inputs of Gaussian processes so far that I've shown you is that you have a choice of kernel. The kernel will be described by a number of hyperparameters, and when you do the reconstruction, you also supply a mean prior. Um, I, I did a bit of tracing back um, when we were writing about the paper, and I think so far the oldest paper I found about Gaussian processes applied to um, cosmology is in 2010 by Holzklaw and collaborators. I hope I didn't mess up this pronunciation too much. Um, so it's quite interesting because it so they reconstruct the evolution of W of Z using a supernovae data. But I, I was I had a little smile when I read the paper because they use also forecasts. And a lot of 
Gaussian process papers that are done today are, are done using also forecasts because with all the upcoming surveys, we want to know if those data-driven model agnostic construction will enable us to do say something about dark energy. So yeah, it's just it's a while ago, and uh, 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 but it was forecast. So yeah, that's great. Um, those three plots show the reconstructions. Um, you have the mean in red and then the errors 168% limits and 95 and in the middle is the fiducial and so you see that they test here the reconstruction using a lambda cdm fiducial and here's a certain quintessence type of oh sorry guys um quintessence type of uh, theory and this is another type of quintessence theory another thing i just wanted to yeah i i must mention i i think there's maybe 30 papers uh, reconstructing something related to the background cosmic uh, expansion um, and so that's i wanted to point the first one and i also wanted to point one that came a few years after just because i haven't mentioned in all the list all the list before the cosmographic approach which is basically um doing a taylor expansion of the of the hubble um parameter but so what was interesting in this paper is that basically using data on supernovae they do a gp on h so here's one over h of z so they reconstruct h of z and then they derive from that uh, the value of the first order cosmographic parameter q of z and uh, so here this is quite a while ago so it's they were using the union 2.1 data set um but yeah so i i wanted to talk about that um, I just want to mention, really, before moving to our work, that there's a lot that has been used in the instrumentation to boost all the pipelines to derive um, measurements, etc. And this is something I have no clue about, but I think Gaussian process shine in that in that area. Um, around the, the the background evolution, the use, I, I just showed you a few example of reconstruction, something H of Z, but all things related to that. But there's another use that's quite, there's been a few papers on is combining strong lens in data and supernovae data. So you can find the anchor point. So you can find H zero. So typically a model independent the derivation of H0 has, um, if you type that in Google, I think you'll find a lot of Gaussian processes with those keywords in. Um, so there's a lot on the background evolution, but not so much a GPA exploration on the perturbations. So there's uh, one paper I found on, um, on, on reconstructing the linear anisot anisotropic stress parameter and a few papers reconstructing the growth rate. Um, so this is single task. Now we're getting to what we applied to um, to the growth of structures. But um, the first, I I am taking one one more slide to talk about um, other people's work, is um, because it was applied to cosmic acceleration first. So what is multitask Gaussian process? So it's basically all the other this, the definition that I showed you are the same, but now you're going to reconstruct several data sets at once. In other words, you're going to consider several uh, functions to reconstruct. So you're going to attribute a subkernel per function, just like we, we saw before, but the kernel that you're going to minimize in your likelihood is going to be the standard kernel of each functions, but the cross kernels are actually convolutions of the basis function of these um, kernels. So now you, when you're adding that, what's happening is that you're acknowledging the fact that function f1 and function f2 is are dependent one another. So there's an in interdependence between those functions. The other good thing is that the, for the three data sets on f1, f2, and f3, you could imagine that you have correlations in the data. So now when you're going to minimize k plus c, you're allowed, you can, you have the possibility of taking into account those um, cross terms, those cross correlations between the data sets. So first, ex the example of um, these 
this paper here, I just want to um, um, give a lot of credit to this paper because when we were doing our research, I was la tête dans le guidon. We say in, fr in, in French, so that means you just pa um, cycling so hard, you don't even look where you're going, but you're just looking at your frame and eventually you can crash as well. So at some point in trying to find ways of reconstructing several functions, I stumbled upon this paper, which explained everything very nicely. And, but this was applied to background expansion and we applied it to growth of structures. But so you see here that they take three data sets, um, supernovae, BAO, um, cosmic chronometers. They reconstruct three different types of function as you, as you can see here. But all of these are underlying traces of how H evolves. So you can see here is different tests of kernels just for robustness, but you can see what is the inference on H0 when they use just cosmic chronometers, the level of precision, and when they start combining all those uh, measurements. You see that the, the precision increase um, a lot. And this is using uh, multitask, multitasking those three, um, those three functions here. Okay, it's time to go to the growth of structures and our um, work. Um, um, so just in a quick word, um, the growth of structures is basically, when you talk about that, is tracing the evolution of matter, um, matter perturbations. Delta M is not something we'll observe straight away. This should be a zero. I missed my copy paste. Um, that is what happens in lambda CM when it's equal to zero. Um, the power spectrum is generally what we observe. So if you have, a, well, indirectly, but the power spectrum will give you an idea of how delta M is. Um, the normalization of this power spectrum, sigma eight, um, is something of importance as well. And another thing of importance is how delta M evolves in, with redshift. And this is generally captured by the linear growth rate F. And once you have with sigma eight and F, you have this uh, growth function, F sigma eight, which is generally what uh, RSD, a redshift based distortion survey will give you. And something new um, of the last past two or three years is that people using combinations between RSD and galaxy galaxy lensing or combination RSD with bispectrum, they managed to break the S sigma eight degeneracy and um, and obtain measurements on F and sigma eight. There's about 30 measurements maybe of F sigma eight today, and those are just way more scarce. But this is something that in the future we'll have more. And this motivates why we wanted to multitask the growth of structures, because we have those three non-independent function. And we had a feeling that this will lead to a nice test of um, the standard model. So what we did is we did forecast. We used Planck Lambda CDM as a as a fiducial. We put ourselves in the context of those future galaxy surveys. We just decided to make very simple mocks, 20 measurements uniformly distributed between zero, redshift zero and two. We say that the error on these measurements is just one percent of the fiducial, and um, to to uh, create a mock, we just do a random draw of the multivariate Gauss Gaussian defined by the mean being the fiducial and the covariance matrix being um, this 1% times the fiducial. Um, just a bit of promotion. We did the multitask GP code is at its beta version, but in the paper, we've um, put the link out um, and it will be worked on and, and made much better in the future. But if you're ever interested, please get in touch with us. I just want to mention that when you go to multitask, you can have like the likelihood can be um, have a few non-local, uh, non-global minima. And we found it was important to use something to test, do tests with something that is stochastic. So not using space, usual gradient descent and all these things. We in the, so we have this in the code. We use we interface also Kobaya, um, that allowed us also very easily to use the this Metropolis Hasting sampler, but also Polycode. And for the same reason as above, we found that using a nested sampler is much better to do MCMC on your multitask than 
standard a metropolis has them we also inter interface emc and all that post processing that you will see will be is done with get disk um so here you go our main result so you see on this plot the joint reconstruction of f sigma f and sigma i just subtracted the fiducial so we can see things better um so this is the realization of one mock and you see that i overplot single task and multitask so that means this gray curve doesn't care of whatever is happening on these other plots while the red is really i've minimized the likelihood this log marginal likelihood of the whole data set um so maybe the first thing that you see is man is wiggly um the precision of the data is such that your your gp will really follow the distribution of the data that you've given um around the fiducial um maybe you see as well that slightly the multitask is even more wiggly than the single task um mtgp is just a short for multitask gp and stgp will be single task um but I'll come back to that in a few slides. Um, I think what you can see is that across most of the redshift, although it's not always true, the error, so here it's the, beg your pardon, the shading represents the 68% limits. You see that the this error is smaller for this multitask than the single task. Another thing that I didn't mention, but yes, they don't trace the same redshift evolution. You, you have a difference, not only the errors, but you have a, a difference in the redshift ev evolution and that's also important that is just the 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 implication of having considered this overall likelihood and you literally have a transfer of information between all the data sets on the reconstructions and the, all that thanks to the fact that you've added those convolution in your kernel uh, just an MCMC to show, um, so beg your pardon, this is optimized. So this is just um, um, minimizing the likelihood. There's no sampling, but we checked what happens when you sample. So there's no point going extreme into detail. In here, a few things to note is that when I do the single task, I just do on one function. So this is three different um, Monte Carlo chain. Um, Markov chain Monte Carlo, beg, beg your pardon. And this is the M MTGP um, chain. So what happens is like, obviously you accept, expect correlations uh, between the two hyperparameters of the same function. So you, you recover this kind of degeneracies where you couple, um, this is the correlation length of F sigma eight and sigma F sigma eight. So you see them here again, but obviously now that is all dependent, you have new um, correlations that appear, and this does depend on the realization of your data set. So yeah, this, th that's an observation. Just want to point out that the best fits, those lines are really close to the mean of the distribution. And this is an important justification. It means that, well, that is because our data mocks are Gaussian. So it makes things nice but also means that if you'd be marginalizing to get your reconstruction you'd get exactly the same as an optimized um, reconstruction which is good for you because it takes much less time to minimize than to marginalize um also the you don't see but the width of the contours increases a lot because of that but also the values of the hyperparameters increases when you do the comparison which is interesting to see, for example, that the what happens when you do the multitask is that the correlation length of all of your three function increases. Um, um, I, I've taken a lot of time. I didn't realize that, but okay. So we just did a bit more statistics. So rather than just looking at one MOOC, we decided to do a Monte Carlo generation of a large number of mocks here the results are for 10,000 and we for example decided to look at what is the distribution of the log marginal likelihoods between single task and multitask and you see that actually the log marginal likelihood of the multitask will always be superior than the sum of the log marginal likelihoods of your each of your single task reconstruction another thing that we do is that we compute a chi squared basically imagining that the reconstruction is now data. And so for each redshift that you pick, you have a, a mean, which will be the, the 
the mean of your GP and the error that will be derived from the covariance of your GP. And you fit, we do that chi-squared with respect to the fiducial, because here we're lucky, we know what's the un true underlying model is the fiducial. And you see that this chi-squared is always better with the multi-star GP. And this is quite important, has an important implication beyond saying this justifies our empty GP is a better fit. But this little exercise tells you that if you remember, um, if I go back here, you remember that the redshift evolution changes here. In principle, the best redshift evolution of your reconstruction will be given by the single task. Because in quotation marks, this reconstruction is not polluted by the effects of the other data sets. Um, but what happens here, oh, sorry. Um, what happens here is that there is this shift, but there's also the increased precision. And that means if the overall fit is better, it means that what dominates really here is the fact that you've increased the precision using MTGP. So you've sh shifted a bit the redshift evolution, but you've increased the, the, the precision. So that's why you have a better fit. Um, just, I said I was gonna come back to those, the fact that you don't recover, you have these wiggles and you don't recover the model. So what to see whether, um, there was a bias or not. We just decided to plot the average distribution of all of these uh, reconstruction. And you see that this average distribution recovers the, um, the fiducial, although it's still wiggly. So you would expect at some point, but maybe that needs millions of mocks for it to become flat. Um, another thing is, since it's wiggly, let's compute if at, at least one redshift, I have a departure between my GP and the fiducial at, of a given significance. So this diagram that you see here should be read to say um, over practically all the mocks will have a region where the GP is ex excludes the fiducial at this significance. And so you see, as you increase the significance, the, um, the chances of having that decrease. So thankfully, um, but what is interesting to see is that even at like four sigma, you still have possible, um, you, you still, you're likely to see that. But more than that is the fact that I was telling you that multitask is slightly more wiggly, it shows here, is that with multitask, this increases. So a corollary of that is just to say multitask is very sensitive to how your data evolves. So in the future, if you have data that you reconstruct and you want to see if there's deviations from lambda CM created by modified gravity or dark energy, then the multitask will be most ab more able, more suited to spot them. So I think this is an important um, corollary of our um, work. Um, just to mention, we did some robustness tests. So we wanted to see what happens here. I'm showing you the example of only F sigma eight, but you can extend um, what happens I think most of the GP papers don't, you have to test whether your results are, depend on your assumptions. So what can all you choose? What mean data? And so we did that and we we're quite confident we chose the best case possible and that was squared exponential. Um, but we also tested something important, which is the range of the, the range, the priors you put on the range of your hyperparameters. Because in principle, you don't want that to be the, what dominates over um, your reconstruction. I, I, let's say, for example, that I say Xi can only be equal maximum to two. I reconstruct a data set and Xi is equal to two. Then something should be understood. And actually I will tell just in a few moments that this happens with current data. And as I mentioned already, we checked that marginalizing and optimizing gives you virtually the same results. Well, that's the application to the current data. Um, so there's been a few papers on the growth of reconstruction F or F sigma eight, and we, we were not really able to find what they did. Um, and I was not either able to understand exactly why they had this and from reading their papers. So basically what happens is that, say now I'm gonna, I'm using a GP and I reconstruct F sigma eight. Um, well, what happens is that I will get this red line, 
which is a completely flat um, reconstruction. So say I've allowed my correlation length to be as large as possible, let's say um, 10 to the power three, then my reconstruction, you see actually by looking at the, the Monte Carlo sapling, the best feed just wants to be the maximum value of the correlation length. So what happens is that it's completely prior dominated. So while what we had checked before, everything was practically, we've shown that thanks to the precision of the future data, things are practically not dependent on the GP assumptions. So we're really getting to this model agnostic view. Well, when you do it with current data, it doesn't work. But for example, if you say like here, this is not a random um, choice, this 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 um, case, the gray case, is I chose to the correlation length, for example, can't be larger than the span of your redshift data. You see that you have a redshift evolution here. Um, so that is maybe a way of, but I don't know if it's it's robust, but that is a way of having recovering what we saw in the other papers. Um, so our conclusion is that simply current data is are too noisy to have a robust robust GP reconstruction. Um, my second to last slide, um, the salesman slide. Um, so I just hope that I've convinced you or close to convince you that data-driven reconstructions are really something that we have to keep in our toolkit in view of um, future, future data, I mean, future from data from future surveys. Um, but it's also, we, we should question what those, how much we can take out of those um, data driven reconstruction and how meaningful they are in our search for um, what is the nature of gravity. Um, among these, I hope I've convinced you, let's say, um, that a multitask approach is very competitive and with future data and F sigma F and sigma it will definitely be able to say something, I think. And yeah, that growth of structures is a great perspective. Here as a final plot of my talk, I'm just showing, there's no multitask here, just a reconstruction of F sigma redshift data, where this is the prediction of what SKA2 galaxy surveys will give. And in red is just, um, this, the, uh, not red, sorry, yellow, is the prediction of lambda CM. So this is just the prediction of lambda CM, forgetting about the data that I'm showing here, the data doesn't take into account, is the prediction of current constraints of lambda CDM. So I just wanted to show what a reconstruction would, with future data will give with respect to the current status of lambda CDM. I just wanna finish that this was supposed to be, this work that we done was supposed to be roughly a three months warm up to our chapter two, um, but in the end it took a year and a half, but I guess that is research. But uh, I'm really looking forward, maybe one day I'll be able to do a third part of the talk with this, and this is something we're working on now with Matteo and our collaborators. So yeah, thank you for your attention. Thank you, Louis, for this very nice talk. It was very insightful. So we have ample time for comments and questions from the audience. Okay, I have a quick question. So you showed in slide 22, uh, the reconstruction of the F sigma eight, and you said that, okay, if you say, if you put the correlation length to infinity, you get this end band, which is more or less flat. But the problem is that obviously, as you know, that the growth at a very high redshift goes to zero. So is there any way you can take this physical, let's say prior into account when you do the Gaussian process reconstruction? So can you introduce, let's say, physical intuition into your fit? In principle, just, just yeah. force it to go to zero at very high redshifts because yes. that's physics. Yeah. No, you're right. You, you probably absolutely can. I mean, the first thing that I see is that the mean prior, um, but um, you can do that. The problem is, there's one important problem is that mm -hmm. this is constrained here because I show you what happens um, where the data is. But in principle, what's going to happen at higher and higher redshift is that your errors are going to completely blow up. So I think what's going to happen in the end is that you're going to try to enforce this inelectoral condition, but the errors are so big that it's not going to have any effect. 
Okay. However, it's a good claim that I've not thought about. So, okay. thank you. <laughs> because usually when I do reconstructions with the genetic algorithms, I enforce priors like that. For example, that the luminosity distance at zero has to be zero. The growth at high redshift has to go to zero, whatever. And then it, this helps with the reconstruction quite a lot. Yeah. Um, but I have to say this yeah. GP view doesn't allow that, that to do it uh, just like easily because we like we forgot about any um, yeah. any like expression um, with genetic algorithm. You still have functions that you can play with yeah. here. You no longer have functions. So I, I'm sure you can put it, but I don't think it's obvious. And I yeah, don't yeah, think it would. Yeah, cool. Yeah, it's it's non-straightforward. Yeah, that was, that, that's why I was asking. Yeah. <laughs> sure, sure. Okay, any more questions, comments? Maybe if I can read just a comment on this part, on this, uh, this thing that Savas was asking, because at some point we, we tried also to use the, um, the mean of the data as a prior in order to try the reconstruction mm -hmm. and see if this was, it was having more sense. It helps, for example, in this case, but still you were having something that doesn't really match what was happening in the literature. Obviously it helps yeah. more if you use the mean of the data when we have the super nice data for future surveys, but yeah. there also the, the data themselves will really tell you everything. So indeed this thing of the priory is something that one has to take care of. Also because like if you put a prior that is zero, I mean prior that is zero along the whole redshift, then when you don't have data, your, your reconstruction will go quite crazy. Yes. Yeah, with the GP is tricky. Yeah. But actually, thank you, Matteo, for this comment. It also reminds me that we tried something else, which was to put Lambda CDM as yes. the mean prior. And what, so that would suit, um, that would kind of reply to what you said, um, Savas. But what yeah. happens is that basically you have, again, a flat reconstruction, but it just follows Lambda CDM. Okay. So it still wants to have sigma, this sigma, uh, yeah. the correlation length to be as big as possible. Yeah, yeah. So this is quite a mystery to me what's happening. I mean, what what I would be curious to know and um, what the, the literature I'm referring yeah. to um, has done. Well, these data are particularly weird anyway, especially the real data, yeah. so, yeah. Yeah, 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 for sure. Okay, any more questions, comments? Okay, if not, then we can thank Louis again for this very nice talk. I can uh, stop the recording.